Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as the slide says, uh, tonight, uh, today, I'm going to be talking about um, going completely native on Google for CI/CD specifically. Um, and before I get into that, I'm just going to talk a bit about um, myself and the company. Um, so I am uh, the co-founder, and I'm also the, the CEO of CloudCover. Uh, so we're a fairly technical company, as you can imagine. Uh, CI/CD is very close to our hearts. Um, we have been instrumental in the creation of these kind of pipelines for DevOps for many of our customers in the region, um, and, and it's been a really fruitful experience to enable the application development teams of these companies and allow them to really get the most out of the platform and accelerate their application development. Um, our teams are spread around uh, Asia, um, primarily in our offices in, in Pune, and um, our office here in Singapore has been growing exponentially over the course of the last year. Um, and we focus primarily on DevOps and data. Um, we work with a lot of the uh, startups and the unicorns in this part of the world. And as you can imagine, the CI-CD problems that they face are massive. It's monster scale. It's lots of microservices. It's many, many deployments in a day. Um, and in many cases, uh, they're moving very, very quickly and breaking things as that happens to you know, occur very, very often if you're deploying um, you know, in a regular basis. Um, we are Google Cloud Data Analytics Specialized, and uh, we're Premier Partners. Um, this is our third Google Summit, <laughs> um, and we'll be back again, obviously, for more. Um, we have a whole bunch of folks that are Data Architect certified um, and are also um, Cloud Architect certified um, to get the most out of the platform. So I'm going to quickly ask for a show of hands. Um, how many of you have used CI CD in the past? And I'm hoping it's a lot. Yeah, that's what I like to see. And I'm assuming that everyone over here is interested in application development, right? Yeah, fantastic. All right, so um, I'm going to give you a very, very short primer on what we consider to be uh, CI, CD in general, and then kind of dive into what it means to be cloud native as well. Um, and you're going to see some logos up on the screen now that, um, that you've probably seen before and are probably using on a daily basis. So firstly, Let's talk about continuous integration and um, continuous delivery. So the CI part of it is all about you being able to push your code straight in and make sure that it's tested automatically, make sure that the security is covered automatically, make certain that it integrates with the rest of the application um, without you having to do too much other than the writing of those tests. And you look, I'm a developer as well. I get it, writing tests sucks. Um, but someone has to do it, and it's usually best if it's the developers that do it. Because um, you, you don't want somebody else writing tests for you. I don't believe that that's the most effective way of getting it done. Um, but if you've written those tests, then you can effectively do this completely automatically, which means that you can speed up the number of iterations and the number of builds that you can do um, and push code with a high level of kind of certainty that it will work when it hits your production environment. Um, and that process of moving that code into production um, is what we call continuous delivery. Now, we've met a whole bunch of customers that are kind of going through this journey into becoming uh, more agile and more DevOps friendly and more what we like to call um, digital native. Um, and a lot of these enterprises face this common kind of push and pull between the ops team and the development team. And that's kind of born of this, this fear that the ops team has that these developers are going to break my perfectly running system with their new feature. Uh, this is an ongoing kind of push and pull. It's a problem that we face in this industry. The incentives for developers and the incentives for operations guys are not aligned. Operations guys care about SLA. Developers care about getting features out. So that, that push and pull between them is kind of the reason why DevOps happened in the first place, to kind of put them both on the same side of the fence and say, hey, how can we work together to increase the speed and the efficiency of the entire development and deployment process? So when that last point comes up of, yes, including pushing to production, that's something that a lot of enterprises are scared of. Um, but if you build your CI/CD pipelines correctly, 
this is actually the only way that makes sense to run your production environment because you shouldn't actually have too much interaction with that environment at all. It should all be automatic if you can help it. And that takes work, that takes effort. And what I'm about to talk to you about is how to reduce the amount of effort, the amount of work that it takes to get from here to there. So what is cloud native? Well, for us, and the definition varies depending upon who you ask, so this is my definition. Um, cloud native means that there are no VMs to manage. All right, and like a lot of people use this as kind of a catch-all for other things. This is the simplest def definition that I could come up with. It means a completely managed service. You might be using Kubernetes, you might be using cloud functions, you might be using a managed service like BigQuery. Um, all of that stuff for us falls into cloud native because there isn't a VM in sight. Um, and that's kind of the whole process here that we're thinking about. The other thing is that cloud native is cost effective. Now, I'll caveat this by saying that if you have an extremely CPU intensive workload, like say you're transcoding video, or you're doing something like um, you know, uh, running a batch job that's doing a massive amount of computation all the time, you're probably not going to want to use serverless too much. Um, the efficiencies that you get in terms of cost are dependent upon utilizing less than 100% of the CPU, which is what allows you to kind of make use of um, this point in time just enough, use what you need, and then get out. Um, that kind of process, that kind of thought, applies only if you don't need it all the time. If you're certain about the amount of usage that you're going to have, if you know exactly how much CPU it's going to need, and it's going to be pegging the CPU the whole time, serverless is not for you. But in the context of CICD, builds don't happen all the time. Builds happen when your developers are certain enough to be able to push their code. Um, and perhaps more importantly, deployments certainly don't happen all the time. So having this be a dedicated environment actually doesn't make much sense. But the tooling around it is such that there's no easy way to solve this problem unless you do what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, so this is, this is kind of the way that we started. This is how we got to this point. And I'm going to kind of spin this around and talk to you about the specifics of how that works for cloud native in particular as it relates to CICD. The other thing is that it's very easy and convenient. Um, what does that mean? That like a lot of the folks, especially in the development world, might not be 100% up to speed with the CICD tooling and the amount of effort that it takes to make that stuff work. It is not easy. It's a lot of moving parts. Many things can break. Sometimes it's the fault of the developers. Sometimes it's the fault of the ops guys. Sometimes it's the fault of the cloud. Um, and all of those things have to work in concert for your CI/CD to actually be effective. Cloud Native takes away some of that pain by making that problem the cloud's problem rather than your team's problem. So that's kind of the reason why I say that it's easy and, and convenient for you to run, because you're not the one that's responsible for managing those services. And that can dramatically reduce the, um, the effort that's necessary from your team's end leading to more productive folks, leading to them doing higher value work. And obviously, that's a virtuous cycle that you want to kind of propagate. I think that this is, they go together, right? So cloud native and CI-CD, specifically because of the way that CI-CD works and because of how it's supposed to um, kind of flow into your workflow and the points at which it gets engaged during the course of, a, of an average, average day, it, they really do go together. Um, I'll give you an example. If you're running a VM, you're running a VM for 24 hours a day, your developers aren't really up 24 hours a day. And you can tell me, oh, you know, I have my VMs on a schedule, and they're going to go off um, at a specific time in the day, right? And I'm going to be optimized. Well, you know what, what happened? You just told all your developers, who are a bunch of night owls, that they can't work at night. That's no good. You want them to be able to push code whenever they want. You want them to be able to deploy that stuff whenever is necessary. And you want them to be able to hotfix into your environment without involving any of your ops guys. So it really does suit the use case of CI-CD. So I'm going to talk to you about an average, normal CI-CD pipeline. All right, This is what tends to happen in most organizations if they've set it up correctly. 
you start off you're writing code and you commit it to git right it goes in there and the very first thing that should happen is you should run a build test cycle you should verify whether that code is working for that developer which means that you want to deploy it you want to test it you want to make sure that it's you know the in integration is working and all those little pieces that are necessary um, you push that out there you want that to be automatic and you want that feedback loop to go back to, to the developer the developer has to be able to fix his stuff before you involve all the other apparatus like pushing it into the staging environment and all of that the step after that is developer thinks you know what this code is awesome it needs to be part of the master branch i want to merge it so he makes the request to merge and the process over there should be deploy that into staging if the merge is approved and you want that to be tested in staging and make sure that it's working properly you want to do sanity tests you want to make sure it's okay and only then you should have a step where usually the person that's in charge of the code line editing and the person who's in charge of making sure that the live production environment is actually meeting the feature sets that requ that are required once you're certain you want to have an approval flow over there to be able to push that into production and that's kind of the whole step over here 1 2 3 4 5 nice and easy let's get it done all right so if we're getting it done what are you going to use well there's a lot of different git options all right um and i'm not even saying that any one of these is best we tend to use github but there are cloud native alternatives as well um cloud source repositories is a service from google cloud um and this one in particular is interesting because um it has a certain amount of free space that's available to you um and you can use that um well within the free tier for a very very long period of time and i'll talk about the specifics of the cost a little bit later but this does most of the work that you would expect from git and um github in particular is a little bit harder to to kind of replace because of the open source community and the fact that that you know those github stars are really nice to have um and and we use it because when we want to open source stuff github is the place to go um and we've got the the enterprise license of that it costs us a lot of money it's worth it for our team but that's not always the case especially if you're running a small company and you just want to get code shipped you just want to put something out there you're building your mvp this service from google source repositories is fantastic as a way to get started the next step ci cd pipelines hands up if you've seen one of these logos before yeah that's what i thought so these are the the big players right most of these folks are um embedded in almost every single one of the companies that we work with and they do a fine job you know they're they're great they get the job done um a little bit complicated in many cases a little bit hard to set up but hey it's code right you got to work with it it's very very difficult um these pieces of software are great uh they're effective at getting the job done there are alternatives that are completely cloud native and every single one of these will require you to either subscribe to a saas service or will require you to run a virtual machine inside your environment in order to be able to process this now you could say i can run this on containers yes you can but you still need to set all of that stuff up and when something goes wrong it's your responsibility to fix it so there is a solution for this and it's called cloud build this is what i love about google their their the naming convention is so crazy it's like it's so obvious what the service does right yeah it builds stuff on the cloud um and it's your ci cd replacement right so it it actually does all of the steps it allows you to effectively do the same stuff that you would normally do in a jenkins for instance or a spinnaker and it works really really well with all the other cloud native pieces that exist on google cloud so it's a great starting point and we've kind of taken it to a certain level with the code that we've written and I'll show you a demo a little bit later and then we're going to open source the project as well so you guys can get access to it um but this is this is kind of the the core of the platform it's the core of the solution that we've built the next step over here is container registries so if you're writing kubernetes um you're creating uh, pods over here that need to be run inside that environment you need to have some kind of a container uh registry that can be used by your environment to actually gain access to that code and to that actual container so this is something that's again one you know native on on google cloud uh you get a certain amount of them free for for the entire month and it resets at the end of each month so once again it's it's very very generous quotas it's only when your dev team grows to a certain point where you really need to start spending money on these services 
it's actually really, really effective, and it gets the job done. Even if you're not using any other parts of this pipeline, I really highly recommend that you use GCR on, GK, uh, on Google Cloud for you to be able to use GKE completely. It takes care of a lot of the security pieces related to getting access to the, the containers and the, the images of them uh, you know, directly from within Google Cloud's API. And these are some of the other options that exist. Um, so the most interesting kind of part about this particular service is I didn't even know about the other guys. This is the only thing that I was using almost from the beginning. Um, and it's been extremely effective for us. The last kind of piece that you need is something to glue this stuff together, to glue this solution together. And historically speaking, you know, you'd go to an IFTTT, you'd go to a Zapier to stick, stick these, uh, these different APIs that exist together. Um, on Google Cloud, there's Cloud Functions, which is effectively serverless functions that allow us to use event-driven um, commands executed at a point in time in the build where one step needs to go to the next. So it ties together services that are otherwise disparate. So all of the different services that I've spoken about so far on the Google Cloud platform, um, they all get stitched together using um, Cloud Functions. So what does it take to kind of tie all of these things together? This is our architecture, and I apologize for the small font. Um, but effectively, what we're doing is we're taking code from GitHub, we're using Cloud Build, which has a native adapter for GitHub, uh, plugging it in over there, and actually pushing the, the final resulting uh, image into the container registry. Your, your Docker files and all of that stuff get compiled into this image and goes into the repository. That then gets used inside Kubernetes engine for your testing, for your staging, for all of those pieces, and then in order for us to kind of report what's happening inside this back somewhere, we push that out to Slack. So everybody in our company uses Slack. I, uh, most of the startups that we work with love Slack as well. Um, you could replace this with you know, any collaboration tool of your choice. We do recommend that it's chat because it's instantaneous and it gives you that right feedback. Slack in particular is great because it offers you some options related to workflow as well, um, which is really great for us to kind of be able to take that process of approval straight into a system that everybody's using you know, all day. All right, so it's coming to that point where things might go wrong. I'm going to do a live demo now. Can I please have access to my computer? Thank you. All right, so I'm going to quickly take you through this project that I've got. So we've built this little demo. Um, it's a really, really simple web page. Uh, this is what it looks like in staging. This is what it looks like in production. So we changed the style sheet so that it was very clear which environment we were on. And we've got these triggers that we've built inside Cloud Build that are tied to when we push code to a specific branch, um, when we push it to master, and that initial pull request that actually does all of these different pieces of build that you're about to see. So I'm quickly going to have to change some code over here. So hopefully this will work. We're in Singapore, so we should probably do that instead. Actually, I'm going to change this. So this, this, um, this over here is actually the testing pieces. And I need to make sure that the tests are modified as well. Otherwise, that'll fail. So I'm actually going to change these to just say Singapore. And I'm going to make a mistake over here on purpose. I'm going to put two exclamation marks inside my source code. And all right, let's go native. All right, and then here's my push. And it worked. Great. So I'm going to switch over to GitHub here and take a look. Hmm. I swear to God this was working earlier. I should see a request for a pull. Oh, 
Oh, there it is. One minute ago. All right. So new pull request. I love my code. So I should be able to create my pull request from here. All right, so the second that I did my pull request, you can see that it's, it's actually making some checks now. So the interesting thing is that because we've got this linked into our uh, Slack, uh, you can actually see what's happening in terms of that build. So you've got a couple of things over here. One is that it's been queued. So you can actually take a look at this build that's happening inside Cloud Build. Oh, look at that. My unit test failed. I wonder why it failed. Ah, that's because hello Singapore with two exclamation marks doesn't match. I gotta change that. Um, give me a second here. I'm gonna switch back, remove that. All right, that's updated. And I should actually see, yeah. So what's happened over here is that it's immediately got the new uh, push, and it started to try the build again. So you'll see over here that the previous one failed, and it tells you what stage it failed at, and it's immediately queued for the next one. And now we can look at the progress of this, which is a separate build, and that's still going. And you can see it doing all the tests and all of that. And it looks like it's fast. No, not yet. Still going. Woo! Look at that. So we now have success. I'm going to come back over here. And you'll note that. All these checks that have passed over here in GitHub actually happened in Cloud Build. So now that I'm ready to go, I'm going to go ahead and merge this request. And what this is going to do now is it's actually going to do a whole bunch of additional tests. So one of the things that Google have currently got in beta is a security scanner. So what it does is it goes through your uh, Docker container that you've built and actually verifies whether there are any known security vulnerabilities in relation to that particular container, which is actually super useful, especially if you're planning on pushing code directly into production from your developers. You want to make sure that there are no known vulnerabilities in that code base. And this feature is available as just part of Cloud Build. You don't have to pay for anything more. It's just one of those things that's there. Um, and it does require a little bit of tuning and stuff to make sure that it works correctly. But once you've got it set up, it's actually a fantastic thing. And there are many, many products out there for the security-minded folks in the audience. Those things cost a lot of money. This is part of Google Cloud and an incredible value. So I'm quickly going to come over here and take a look at what's happening with this particular build. So the other thing is that we link the, the actual code here. Um, and you can actually see directly linked from inside um, our, uh, our build process over here inside our CICD bot you can actually see all the changes that happen. So this is the change log associated with that particular merge request. And if I click over here, you'll see the build progress. So because all of these things are linked in Slack, you don't have to remember what that build number was. You don't have to worry about that you know, specific registry code. None of that stuff matters. It's all right there. Because Slack kind of has a history associated with it, you don't even have to worry about like, you know, your audit trails and stuff. You can actually see it all right there in the history of your, of your chat log. And this is the reason why we love Slack for this kind of work, because it gives us an auditable trail. You can kind of search for a specific build and look at who initiated it. Um, once you kind of get used to doing it this way, irrespective of what your CI CD pipeline is, we find it very hard to go back. So you can see that we're doing a whole bunch of additional things over here. So we're performing the unit tests. We're building a Docker image. We're pushing that out to GCR. We're generating a manifest for staging. We're deploying it to staging. We're performing integration tests over there, a little bit of security in there. Um, and then finally, we're actually also building the production environment and keeping it ready. You'll note that we built it, but we haven't deployed it to production. This is incredibly important. We've built it. The image is ready to go. 
if we want to, we can pull the trigger and it'll get deployed in a matter of seconds. But before we do that, we should do some sanity tests. So in our staging environment, I haven't refreshed this page yet. This is what it was before. Look at that. It now says, hello, Singapore. So we actually deployed this to a container that was running on GKE, updated the code while I've been talking to you. And you'll notice that the production environment over here still hasn't got anything. Why? Well, because we're still waiting for the results of our image vulnerability scan. And it looks like no vulnerabilities were found in this image. Now, this is not a very compelling demo because there's nothing meaty over here for me to look at and say, oh my god, look at the amount of vulnerabilities. Before we set up this demo, we changed that to the Alpine version of Node. Before this, we were running on Node Latest. And let me just show you what that looked like in the vulnerability scanner. So these are the other images that are there. Uh, OK, this is, that's the specific application that we're building here. And this is where we made the switch to Alpine. Before that, we were using Node Latest. And look at all this stuff that Google Security Scanner basically found for us. That's a lot of problems. I don't want any of that stuff in production. All right, so lucky for us, that's already taken care of because the current build the one I just made three minutes ago is actually just fine. No vulnerabilities found. We're all clear. So I can just hit yes. And we are now going live. Just as easy as that. And this is the, the part that's so amazing about this. This click of a button can happen from anybody, anywhere, Anyone's Slack account, I could do that on my phone and it would work, right? And that's incredibly valuable. It's late at night, you know, you don't want to have too much work to do over here. A developer somewhere has kind of fixed the problem and you just want to make sure that there's that last check, that last approval. You want somebody to kind of hold the keys here and say, it's my responsibility if production goes down. He hits that button and we're good to go. And once that's done, we're live. Thank you. Can we switch back to my slides, please? Thank you. All right, so only one thing went wrong, right? That was pretty good. All right, so I've made a few assumptions over here just to give you an idea of the costs associated with the system that I just demonstrated. So if you have five developers, and let's say that your average build process takes about five minutes, and let's say you have about three gigs of source, which is a lot for source code, um, because you're not, pushing your, <laughs> you're not pushing your includes into your source, right? Like, nobody does that. That's like, no good. Um, yeah, so this is what you're doing, and you're doing about 24 builds a day. You would end up paying a grand sum of zero dollars for this entire platform. That's what you get for free on Google Cloud within those bounds. Within the free tier, this is what you get. This is every single Google Cloud account. Now, this does not include the actual Kubernetes engine pods that you're running. Obviously, that stuff costs you real money. But the entire build process, including the Kubernetes environment and the containers that are used for the Docker build process, are all covered inside this cost. That's a pretty sweet deal. I mean, if you're a small dev shop or you're a skunkworks project that's just trying to get off the ground, once you set this stuff up, you can actually scale very, very far. And even if you start paying money for it, as Cloud Cover has already started doing, because obviously we're using this stuff very extensively, um, you know, it doesn't break the bank. It's very, very affordable. So I highly recommend, at the very least, taking a look at this and see if it fits your specific use case. Um, it's been incredibly useful for us, and I believe that it has dramatically improved the speed with which we're able to take code, build it, and push it into production with, you know, a relatively high degree of success. Um, so as promised, we have made this repo public. So please feel free to go over there, uh, download it, clone it, fork it, do whatever you want with it. It's free for you guys to use. Um, and if you want to know more about how we built it and the specific technologies involved, uh, please stop by our booth. Uh, I think we're just, a, just outside and a little to the left. Um, can't miss it. Big cloud cover logo. Um, we'd love to have you, and I'd love to have a conversation with you about um, you know, whether you like this stuff and uh, what we could potentially do together uh, to get it working for you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I've been Vishal Barpia. Follow me on Twitter, at Viz. And uh, thanks very much. <laughs>